Hello, welcome to an episode of the Let People Prosper series. My name is Dr. Vance Ginn. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have a great warrior for freedom and liberty, tax reforms, tax cuts, elimination of income taxes, and he's just done so much over a number of years, it's hard to put into words. But I'm glad to have Grover Norquist on the program. Grover, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Absolutely. Good to be with you. Thanks, Vance. Well, good. Well, um, for our audience, I want to give them a, a, your, your bio here before we really get going. Uh, we are recording this on October 27th, 2022, so just before the 2022 elections that are going on. So in case anything else breaks, that's the date that we recorded this. Um, so Grover Norquist is president of Americans for Tax Reform, also known as ATR, a taxpayer advocacy group. Group. He founded in 1985 at President Reagan's request. ATR works to limit the size and cost of government and opposes higher taxes at the federal, state, and local levels and supports tax reform that moves towards taxing consumed income one time and at one rate. ATR organizes the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, which asks all candidates for federal and state office to commit themselves in writing to the American people to oppose all net tax increases. And the 115th Congress, 212 House members, and 45 senators have taken the pledge. Uh, Norquist chairs the Washington, D.C.-based Wednesday meeting, a weekly gathering of more than 150 elected officials, political activists, and movement leaders. The meeting started in 1993 and takes place in ATR's conference room. There are now 48 similar center-right meetings in, in 40 states all across the country. He also serves on a number of boards. He's written books, um, and he's just an overall good guy. Um, so I'm glad to have the happy warrior Grover Norquist on the program for for our audience. So Grover, what I like to start with is I really like to know what motivates you to do what you do and have been doing this for such a long time now, you know, starting with President Reagan and up to now. What really drives you, Grover? Uh, freedom matters. And I was born in the United States. If I was in Belgium, uh, you could work all day to get the Belgian government just absolutely perfect. And the Germans or the French would still eat you. Uh, yeah. But in the United States, there's really an obligation to make it work here. Because if it works here, we have the chance to make it work everywhere else. If it doesn't work here, it doesn't work on the planet. So liberty is important for everybody, but it's particularly important to keep it working and moving forward and putting its best face forward and making it clear what you're up to for the rest of the world, uh, for history, because you're in the United States. Great answer. Uh, I love it. Um, what are some of the key things that you've experienced throughout your career, whether it be with, with Reagan or others that are really highlights um, that the audience might, might find exciting? Well, I think I mean, I, right, I, right out of college, uh, I went to go work for the National Taxpayers Union, became executive uh, director there. And that was during Proposition 13 in California and the tax revolt from Massachusetts to California to Idaho across the country. Uh, and that presaged Reagan's victory, which was about spending and taxes and regulations and the Soviet Union. Uh, but the tax revolt was, was very impressive there. Then it was largely through the initiative process. It was not led by elected officials. Uh, in fact, when Reagan ran in 96, he wasn't leading with the tax issue. Uh, and I think we learned that the tax issue is the central issue in American history. Uh, go back to the founding fathers, go back to the tariff and the way that tore the country apart, go back to how we tax liquor and to the first problem that the country had with uh, when they started to tax uh, cider uh, and so on. And you had the revolt against the new government uh, based on people's unhappiness about taxation. It is the visible, tangible part of government. I mean, you can talk about a lot of things, but if the government can't steal your money, take your money to do stuff, then all this other stuff doesn't happen. So the size of government, the power of government, the intrusiveness of government, the annoyance of government are all in the tax issue to start with. Uh, and if you can nip it in the bud there, then you don't have to worry about the annoying things that happens when the government spends that money to push you around. Well, that's right. And I mean, you've seen a number of things during that time. You saw what Reagan tried to do in the 1980s. Um, you saw President Clinton say the, area of, the era of big government is over. <laughs> um, but we're seeing a lot of that come back now with massive spending. And, and, and it went, went away in some sense. But, but even Reagan ran up you know, some massive deficits, which, of course, was Congress has the power of the purse. Um, they were spending a lot then. And so it, it, we also need to take into account that spending really matters as well, right? Yeah, well, the power of the state. Uh, the reason they raise the government raises money in taxes, whether you're the, the king of France or the, a president, an elected official or 
somebody from ancient Rome is in order to spend the money. That's why they take it in the first place. Uh, and so the two are both important uh, to the extent that we can reduce what the government spends, you reduce what they need to tax. If you have a limited, let's say you were to write a constitution, say the government's only going to do a few things. That would solve the problem until the Supreme Court went funny in the head. Uh, but the, the, they did think they kind of had that one settled. You know, here's a list of things you can spend money on. Government can't get too big, can it? Uh, it's a constant fight. Look, the people, there are some people who want to run other people's lives. I don't understand it. It's never made any sense to me. It's not uh, a vice that, that I find. I have plenty of vices. This is not one of them, the desire to run other people's lives for them. Uh, and yet there's always the group in every society that decides they are the aristocracy or should be, and they should make all the rules or should, uh, and they can only do that through the state. And so they want to get control of the state, control of taxes, control of spending, control of other people's lives. Uh, and what I've tried to do is organize those people who don't want to run other people's lives. I, there, there are two coalitions in American politics. And I think one of the things that I've been helpful in doing is framing what those are for people who go, got it. The first is the Leave Us Alone Coalition. That's the Reagan Republican Party uh, in a phrase. What is it? Around the circle, around the table, everybody in the Reagan Republican coalition is there because on their vote moving issue, not all issues, they're not libertarians, on their vote moving issue, they wish to be left alone. Go around the table, taxpayers, people concerned about the second amendment, they wanna be able to have the right to keep and bear arms. You have a hope that people who wanna to go to private school, people who wanna run a small business, people who uh, wanna practice their faith and transmit it to their children. Uh, and then there are the smaller groups, people who don't want to wear helmets when they ride a motorcycle, so they can be organ donors, uh, people who uh, want to vape and not be told what to do there. So you go around the table, and sometimes some issues are bigger than others or more important than others. They want to be left alone. And I think there are two things that are important. One is people want to be left alone from foreign invasion. So an army it is an important project of a, of a government. Uh, as long as the guns are pointed outward, we need enough of an army and a national defense to keep the Canadians on their side of the border, then we're fine. Uh, and also uh, police, uh, where people can be protected against criminals. But a large part of that, and maybe even a larger part of that, is the right to keep and bear arms, because the police do not show up when you have the problem. They show up and draw the nice little chalk mark around your body, which is helpful, but it's not quite what you're looking for. So the Leave Us Alone Coalition is a collection of people, most of whom who do not work for the government, a small number do. They work in important things the government does that help you be left alone by other people, armed forces and, and police to go after criminals. And that is a vast majority of the American people properly understood. Uh, the challenge is that the other coalition, the Takings Coalition, around the table of the left, and I was asked this question when Hillary Clinton was up in upstate New York doing the listening tour. And because if she did a talking tour, she wouldn't have gotten elected. But she was right. a <laughs> tour. Yes. And she said to a reporter, what progressives need, they, they'd driven liberal into the dirt, so they moved to progressive, which is what they had before liberal, but they drove progressive into the dirt. They keep having to change their name like some, <laughs> some wanted criminal. Oh, They're I'm always sorry. redefining terms, right, Grover? They need to. They need to because yeah. when they get one, they dirty it. And people don't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah. But the shit around the progressive table, we need a meeting like Grover has, is what she said. And the guy calls me, uh, press guy calls and says, what about that? And I told him exactly what I told you. Here's the center right coalition of people who want to be left alone. And the good news for Republicans and conservatives is that around that table, there is no conflict among the people in the room on a vote moving issue. They may disagree on secondary or tertiary or cardinary or whatever five is, but but on vote moving issues, you want to go to church all day? You want to fondle your guns all day? I want to make money all day. Hey, are we in conflict? No, go do your stuff. We'll meet next time. So there's, they're not in conflict. The left, however, around their table, trial lawyers, labor unions, big city political machines, the two wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare dependency and people who make $120,000 managing that dependency, making sure none of them get jobs and ever become Republicans. Uh, then you have all the coercive utopians, the people who are better and smarter than you and me, uh, and they know how to run our lives and our children's lives much better than we 
ever would. And so they're the guys who invented and mandated the uh, light bulbs that convince you have glaucoma uh, and the toilets they are too small to flush completely. And on the Sabbath, they insist that you separate the white glass from the brown glass from the green glass for the recycling priests. And they have a list of things you have to do and a list of things you may not do that is slightly longer and more tedious than Leviticus. It just goes on and on <laughs> and on. And these are not you know, thick recommendations. These are mandated. So around the left's table, they can get along only if we're stupid enough to keep throwing money into the center of the table. If we do that, then they can cheerfully sit in the room and look like that scene after the bank robbery. One for you, one for you, everybody gets cash. That's why the minute Clinton or Obama or Biden get elected, what's the first thing they do? Big pile of money right in the middle of the table. What? Stimulus for, for Clinton. Uh, COVID, well, COVID was in the back rearview mirror. Co uh, something to do with cash, we want the cash, shut up. $1.9 trillion, it doesn't really matter what you label it, but there are people and mouths to be fed around the left's table. So you have yeah. to have the cash and you need to have higher taxes to keep the cash coming. And that's why the left is always about how do we raise taxes, get more taxes, spend more money on their governing coalition, which they, they, they do it right, they can actually get a majority sometimes. But the challenge for the left is that around that table, those people are not in agreement, unlike the Republican coalition. The only thing they have in common is they want other people's money. And if we do our job and stop tax increases, that cash begins to dwindle, the pile of cash. And while you and I might look at it and go, that seems to be an awful lot of money in the middle of that table, they look at it like the Kennedy kids with like a six pack in the front of the middle of the table, and this is not gonna work. So when there's not enough money, then the left's coalition looks at each other like the second to the last scene in the lifeboat, lifeboat movie uh, where they're trying to decide who they're going to eat or who they're going to throw overboard because there's not enough for everybody. The left is made up of competing parasites. And if we don't feed them taxpayers, they will gnaw on the guy next to them. So those are the two coalitions. What's our goal? Yeah. Taxes low, spending low, keep everybody protected, but not told what to do and to make the left dwindle in size so people can have more freedom. And every time you don't hire a new bureaucrat or even fire a new bureaucrat, that's somebody who can walk over to our table, get a job and become part of the Leave Us Loan Coalition. Now, I like that separation between those two. Do you find that even on the right, I mean, you had, you had the Reagan sort of Republican, the more conservative. It was a kind of a mixture between the more libertarians and conservatives. I, I consider myself a classical liberal, more on the lowercase libertarian side in a lot of ways. And there seems to be a little bit more of a divide that's been happening kind of with the national conservatism, the populism sort of movement. Do you, do you think that as well? Or what do you, what do you see as, as, as heading on the right side? I see the Dr. Seuss children's book, uh, The Day It Rained Ubla. That is one where the king gets bored with sun, wind, fog, and snow. And so he invents Ublek because he's bored with the stuff that he has. And that rains down, it's green, it's sticky, and it's miserable. And until he says he's sorry, it doesn't go away. There are public intellectuals in the United States who have been in the center right, and they want to be important. And the problem is everything you need to know about free markets was written by Bastiat and Adam Smith and popularized by Milton Friedman and other people. You are not going to be rich and famous and thought of as Camus and Sartre. I mean, France, they care about intellectuals. They're, oh, what did Sartre say today? Nobody in a commercial republic like the United States cares about that stuff. And so you have these frustrated people who want to rethink the world within a center-right context. They're not Bolsheviks, but, it, and then they show, I know, I could use the power of the state for good, okay? Th those movies always end very badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will use the ring for good. No, you won't, Frodo. It just won't work that way. Don't, don't take <laughs> power on yourself. Yeah. And so you have a bunch of, this happens all the time. Oh, we'll have a modest, back in the 60s, a modest welfare state. That'll work. It doesn't stay modest, okay? You know, when you, when you swallow a tapeworm, it grows. You can't, I'll have a small tapeworm, please. Could I order a small tape? No, you can't order a small tapeworm. You've ordered a tapeworm, it's going to get bigger. You have a government program, it will get bigger. It will not do what you want it to do. It will do what the government wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So we'll constantly think, I will, for the first time in history of the world, find a government program that will behave and be just a disciplined little tapeworm that never grows to be annoying. 
and they always end up bad. Remember big government conservatism? And not long, during the Reagan years, they said, we will use the power of the state for good. No, you won't, or it won't end up well. Whole countries think, oh, love a strong man, take over. It'll be okay, he'll do good things. He will do what he wants, that's what will happen. The government will do what it wants. So yes, this, this is, we've seen this a hundred times before throughout history, and people who have this idea that they're, all of the welfare programs fail, the labor unions didn't represent workers, but I imagine a labor union structure that might work. Doesn't exist in the real world, you've already got one built, and you know what, if you say we're gonna have a good union do this, the old unions will take it over. It, these things will all crash and burn, I, they do not keep me up at night other than it's frustrating and tr trying to explain yeah. to some. You do know this has been done a hundred times before. It has always failed. And hubris is your sin. You think yeah. that you can figure out a way to use state power without danger. Can't happen. Doesn't happen. It is it is frustrating for me, too. I mean, when I see it, it seems like what they are looking at, they identify a lot of the key problems, right? There's a labor market issues. There's low paid wages. There's tr trade with China. I mean, some of these things are issues, but the, but the problem, the underlying problem is usually government. It's a government failure. So you can't solve a government failure with more government. It just exacerbates the problem. It makes the situation worse. But here's the challenge there. This is what the Chamber of Commerce type people do sometimes. We have a problem and because we have all these labor laws and tort laws and all these other things. So, but it's a lot of work to go fight the left and the structures that have billions of dollars. So here's what we'll do. We'll go, we'll go raise taxes to start a new program to do something that has been made impossible to do because of these other programs. So they think they can fight taxpayers more easily than fighting the, the component parts of the state. And I understand it's a lot of work to make the state get smaller. I've been at it quite some time with some success. And oddly enough, there's a great deal yet to do, but there's not a shortcut. And beating up on taxpayers and taking power to the state to, to do something when what you really needed to do was undo something. First of all, you're, you're fighting the wrong team. And we just have to calmly talk these people down, buy them a drink, get them to play golf or, or indulge in cocaine or something non-destructive rather than trying to harness the power of the state for good. Yeah, no, that makes I, sense. You and I know these people, they're not bad people. No. They're trying to take a shortcut that doesn't work. And what's frustrating is if you've read Little Red Riding Hood, you know how it ends. Quit looking for the shortcut. Yes, yes, that, that's right. Well, I, I, I was going to talk about that later, but I'm glad we just get that out in the front now <laughs> um, because there's so much to go that goes on with this discussion. And it is a lot of our friends, right, um, that will still continue to have these discussions. And hopefully that, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast was to expound on the free markets, individual liberty, personal responsibility. These are the sort of things that we need to get back to and make sure we don't we don't lose or go further in the other direction. You know, I um, as you know, Grover, I worked in the Trump administration for a while as a chief economist for OMB, and I saw a lot of that internally at the White House when you talked about, you know, tariffs and what the costs were of, of tariffs and the protectionism. I know, I know. And, you know, I think that's something that I, I get it that there are issues with trading with China, but, you know, there are other ways of going about it than, 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 than what, than tariffs. More well, importantly is to cut corporate income taxes, cut spending here, cut regulations so that way we can grow our economy and manufacturing and everything else here in the United States and, and not somewhere else. Um, and that's something that you've been doing for so long. I mean, Air Americans for Tax Reform has been pivotal, I believe, in keeping taxes lower than it otherwise would be and continuing to work not only at the federal level, but among the states. And so you'll have the tax pledge, but what are some of the key reforms that you see going on right now across the country? Sure. First step one, as you say, is the tax pledge. The Taxpayer Protection Pledge was created in 19, oh, uh, 1985, 86, 1986, uh, in order to pass the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Yeah, uh, and 1985, on, yeah. from your bio, yeah. Yeah, 1985, uh, and we started sharing it. We got 100 people the first year in the House, 50, uh, 20 in the Senate, and then eventually built up to where we have almost everybody in the House and Senate who's a Republican. We have no Democrats anymore. We used to get some. They all switched parties or lost an election. Uh, the biggest division between the two parties is not even guns or life or any number of other issues. It's the tax issue. There isn't a Democrat, including the moderates, who won't raise taxes every chance they get. And there isn't a Republican who won't help you fight against tax increases and 
cut taxes. So at the national level, we have that division. Everybody who's ever been president since then has taken the pledge. The one guy who broke it, George Herbert Walker Bush, had a very successful presidency. Soviet Union destroyed uh, without a lot of blood on the floor. Iraq kicked out of uh, Kuwait without sticking around for a generation. Let's see what happens. You know, it was a very successful presidency, except for one thing, tax increase, he lost. That's when the modern Republican Party said, take the pledge, win the primary. Take the pledge, win the general. Keep the pledge, get reelected. And if, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a chart from 1932 to 19, the yellow line, 1994. That's 62 years. The Republicans controlled Congress for four of 62 years. Why? Well, because, well, sometimes they'd raise taxes, sometimes they wouldn't. You know, they were the Washington generals uh, up against the Harlem Globetrotters. They had no power. Uh, they were completely impotent. Uh, even Republican presidents could slow things down. They'd wait till he goes, I don't know, goes away, and then we pass everything. But in 94, when 95% of all the Republicans signed the pledge and kept it, uh, since 94, we've had the House and the Senate 60% of the time, 60% of the time, maybe looking to get it back again. We're competitive. Matter of fact, 60 is oh, more than 40. We're dominant. We're winning the House and the Senate more often than not. Sometimes you get the president, make big jumps forward. Sometimes you just have the House and Senate, you move through slowly. That was the dividing line when the Republican Party became the party that would not raise your taxes. They might invade small countries they can't pronounce. That cost us a little bit <laughs> there when we lost the House and Senate. But we will not raise your taxes. And that brings you the government more than half the time. Step one. I think we could just stop there. <laughs> but of course, there's, yeah, there's more to it two. than that. Yeah, yeah, we need a step two. What's step two? Step two is bring spending down figure out how to make the list of things the government does and privatize them, take all those government pensions that are defined benefit, which by definition are controlled by the government until you die, uh, and change them to defined contribution pensions like a 401k or an IRA, where it's your money from start to finish. And when you want to leave, say, thank you very much. I'm tired of this job. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to take all my pension with me as opposed to, oh, I wish you'd stayed long enough to vest. <laughs> that, that was a mistake on your part. Or, I'm sorry, we're Detroit. We forgot to steal enough money to pay for your pension, didn't we? Whoops, you're in trouble. Uh, we want to make sure that every government worker can walk away anytime they want to, not have golden handcuffs, keeping them as a government employee, walk away with their pension and go do something else, hopefully in the private sector. But that's the first state to do it completely. For all new hires was Utah, and I think we're getting state by state. We're doing much better. The armed forces are now doing this. That's progress. And of course, the private sector has almost completely moved over to that uh, system, except in some heavily unionized industries, which are killing the very industries that they that they prey on. So moving something into people's own hands, personally, health savings accounts instead of government programs, personal uh, you know savings accounts, and then for education, uh, allowing people to have an education savings account or a voucher or a scholarship or whatever however you want to call it, where the government promises to spend ten or $15,000 on your education, that check goes to your parents and they can take it to homeschool or to a pod or to a, a Christian school or a parochial school or to a secular private school uh, or to the school down the street, the one that you always went to, or the one further down the street that you prefer. Um, that will allow 6% of GDP to become competitive. And why did we expect a government monopoly would be a good way to educate our children? We knew that it was a dumb way to make steel um, yeah. uh, or copper or cars or, or computers, but we think it's a good idea for education. And it's been a very expensive lesson. Monopolies always serve the monopolist not the customers. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I mean, I think you, not only with education, but with healthcare. I mean, healthcare is dominated by government as well. And no wonder we have such extremely high prices. Uh, the quality is okay because there's some private sector that can allow for some of that to happen, but it's overregulated, um, too much spending, too little supply along the way. And that's exactly what we're seeing in education. So I, I think you're, you're right that we need to really focus on spending. I, I wonder what you think about this. So it, it kind of in, in, in my view, or a lot of times what I talk about is, you know, spending comes first, right? You, you outline step one and then step two. But if you're, if you're thinking about whenever you're developing government, 
the demands from the citizens are to say, look, let's join together because we can't do this in the private sector. Like we need a national defense. So we're going to put together an army. We need bureaucrats to help with that and everything else. Then you're going to fund it. So you need spending. And then you decide on what tax system you want. That's going to be the least burdensome in the economy. That's just going to fund that particular amount of government spending. Um, so it almost looks like to me that government spending should come first and, and then taxes and, and to make sure that taxes aren't burdensome in the overall economy. But I guess that's maybe whenever you first start things, maybe not necessarily later on, because I think your maybe your point, I'd love to get your reaction is, is that if you don't focus on the tax cuts first, then you can't restrain spending. What, what, do, what do you see there as the combination? Well, when we set up the constitution, we started with this is a list of things you can do and spend money on, and also a very short list of things you can tax. And yeah. so they tried to regulate both. They were wise to do both of those. If you had, a, if you had, well, we have a limited number of things we're going to spend on, but we have a tax system that generates a bunch of cash fairly quickly. Who's ever running the government would notice this pile of cash and decide to spend it, regardless on what promises they'd make. Yeah. So it is very important that you keep taxes low, visible, and clear, transparent as to who's paying what and how big, how much they are, uh, and difficult to raise. That's why a single rate income tax at the federal level hopefully someday but at the state level within five yeah. years most states will have a single rate flat rate tax um and and they're the ones that aren't already there are moving there and what does that do very difficult to raise a single rate tax because yeah the politician has to look at everybody i'm again before i moved to the united states i lived in massachusetts we have a single rate tax there and in massachusetts it's five percent big liberal state you think it'd be ten percent like new york and new jersey and california Five percent. Why? Because the income tax is a flat rate. You, if you want to raise tax, you have to look everybody in Massachusetts in the eye and say, "I'm going to raise your, all of your taxes." Now we go. Then we're all listening, and the guy, oh, forget it. It's not that good idea. And so, taxes of on the income tax have been kept down because it's flat. And if you have a flat rate tax, it's much easier to reduce a single rate tax because everybody benefits. If there's a tax cut and the left goes just for the rich. Well, you could do that when a graduate income tax. You, you could be lying, but you could say it and people are confused. But if it's a single rate tax, it goes from five to four. Oh, only the rich are doing this. Everyone goes, what are you talking about? Five to four for everybody. We get it. Flat rate taxes, easier to reduce, difficult to raise. I like flat rate taxes, not because they're fair. Taxation is taking money from people who earned it and giving it to people who maybe didn't earn it. Fairness is really not an issue here. But difficult to raise is an issue. And there's a sense of fairness from people. But I understand it, got it. Let's take it down, not up. Um, so on the on the tax front, go to a single. The fewer taxes, the better. All taxes are raised to the breaking point, to the point where politicians' careers are broken. But if so, if you're uh, in a state that has a property tax, a sales tax, and an income tax, all those taxes will be raised until people start to lose an election. Then you pull them down a little bit, but. And this was the example in New Jersey. New Jersey at one point had a no sales tax and no income tax back in 1965. So, oh, property taxes are too high. So they added the sales tax. Uh, and then the property taxes and sales taxes got high. So 10 years later in 77, they added an income tax. They swallowed a third tapeworm to keep the other two <laughs> tapeworms, you know, under control. So yeah. now what do they have in New Jersey? high property taxes, high sales taxes, high income taxes. It's all worse if they'd stayed with just the ridiculous property taxes. Those would have been raised until people lost elections and they'd have been pulled down. So fewer taxes, single rate taxes that teach tax everybody themselves. Uh, and then at the, at the spending level, you want to constantly be looking at how do we keep spending down? How do we have competition between the states, between products? School choice will make the public schools that exist better. It's the only way to make them better. You can't throw money at them. We've been throwing money at them. They get no better with more money. You cannot yell at them and make them better. You can have competition and they will become better or they'll shrink. It'll be in their interest to do better. Yeah, no, that's totally true. And I, um, so, I mean, sound tax policy, right, is the broadest base possible with the lowest rate. 
And to your point as well, having as few as possible as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm more in favor with, with you of a flat tax overall. I think we should have that at the federal level. I would love to see the day for us to go to a consumption tax. I would prefer that over the income tax at the federal level. I don't know that we'll get there with the 16th Amendment. Um, but, I, but I think by reducing the burdens that are on the economy, if you tax income, you're going to get less, less work. Right, because that's really where income comes from. Less work, effort. We see that incentives matter. It's one of the number one things in economics. Um, if you're taxing consumption, well, you're you're raising the cost of consumption, but you're incentivizing savings, which savings drives capital investments and, and other things throughout the economy. And not that not that a tax can stimulate things, but it does have less of a distortionary effect than something like an income tax or or, or a tariff or property taxes, which is kind of a wealth tax. And so I think if we can get something like that, something like in Texas, um, where I happen to live, where there is no personal income tax, you know, and I think one of the things that you do a great job of explaining, Grover, is how those states without an income tax, the Floridas, the Tennessees, the, the Texas of the world, those are the ones that continue to grow at a faster pace, and they tend to have more revenue. That's not a benefit in my view, but, but it does help to fund things along the way, whereas those states that have high income taxes, like the Californias and the New Yorks, we're also seeing people that are, are leaving them in droves to go to the lower tax states. Um, the Tax Foundation just released their state business tax climate index, um, and uh, again, th those states that are near the top tend to be those without an income tax. Those states at the bottom, New Jersey, New York, and California, all have very high taxes, like you just said there. Um, and so I think what's been really key is some of the state tax flat, the flat tax revolution that's been happening over the last couple of years. And I know you've been instrumental in that. What's been going on there? What, what have you been so excited about? I don't know how well people can see this, but the green states, there are eight of them, have no personal income tax. Some of them, unfortunately, including Texas, have corporate income taxes, mm -hmm. and they need to work on getting those down and or out. North Carolina. Well, uh, te so Texas has the franchise tax, the gross receipts tax, which is even worse. And it, North Carolina is getting their corporate income tax will be gone in four years. There are nine yellow states that have a flat rate income tax. And then the orange states here, Arizona, Iowa, Mississippi, Georgia, that's four. This map's old because... Idaho just recently became the fifth state to pass a law that says we're going to a single rate tax. Uh, Arizona will be single rate in January. So will Idaho. It'll take four years for Idaho, for, for Iowa, Iowa to go from an 8.6% top rate to a 3.9% flat rate tax. But that's law of the land. That's going to take place. And both Mississippi and Georgia go down to a lower single rate tax. There are another five of the red states that are going to go to a single rate tax before they begin the march down to zero. There are 10 states right now where the governor, the state legislative leadership says, we're going to zero. That is our policy. Uh, certainly North Carolina has been working on that for 12 years, getting very close. Our friends in New Hampshire still have to get rid of their stupid tax on dividends and interest, but four years from now, they will be completely free of any uh, personal income tax. Kentucky has a 12-year march to a zero income tax. Louisiana, a 15-year march. Mississippi uh, is one vote away from being able to go all the way to zero over a 10-year period. They're going a third of the way in three years, and they're going to go back and do more. Arizona is committed to going to uh, zero. They're down to 2.5% starting January, then to zero. Uh, our friends in North Dakota talked to the governor a couple of nights ago. They're going from a 2.9% uh, 2 top rate to 1.5% flat rate and then on to zero. Uh, so we're looking at a lot of states moving to zero and to single rate taxes so that when we talk about the federal tax, pretty soon it won't just be 50, a, a majority of the states that, are, that have a single rate tax. It'll be a super majority of states that have a single rate tax because zero is a single rate plus the ones that have non-zero uh, single right. rate. And that will drive California and New York. What's going to save California is all the other states taking their income taxes towards zero, and California is going to have to improve itself. Yep. Federalism, right? Uh, laboratories of competition that, that allow for that to happen to see what works well and what doesn't work well. The, the Democrats have figured out that federalism was put in by the founders to advantage the Republican Party against the Democrats. 
because the modern Republican, Reagan Republican Party has good ideas like school choice and welfare reform and lower taxes and less regulation and putting all the trial lawyers in a big bag and floating them down the river. All of those things are very, very helpful. And if you do them in one state, that state gets better and other states can look at it and say, I want some of that. And that's how lower taxes have swept across the country. Tort reform, not enough, but much sweeping across the country. School choice is going state by state. Welfare reform, state by state. Uh, transparency went state by state. Some of the good ideas on health care have gone state by state. Uh, and you can take a good idea, one state, and do that. What the Democrats can't do is take any of their ideas and try them out on Vermont and then have anybody else want to do them. They actually did pass single payer in Vermont. They had to repeal it because it's a really mm. stupid, destructive idea. They passed a, a version of uh, Clinton care or Obamacare in Massachusetts under Dukakis. So when he ran against George Herbert Walker Bush, he said, I passed health care reform where the government runs everything perfectly. Never took effect. As soon as he lost the election, Massachusetts strangled it in the crib because they said, this will destroy our state. <laughs> we can't wow. have this here. Yeah. Now, they wanted to put into the entire government to the United States, what they knew failed in Vermont and Massachusetts. So Democrats cannot take an idea at the state level and build from it. All dumb ideas have to be done nationally. Yep. Yep. They don't scale up. Right. So one of the, the issues, right, I guess the uh, play devil's advocate is, is that you have all these states that are cutting taxes. I mean, surely they're not going to be able to fund everything that they need to fund at the state level. And they're going to run into the Kansas problem. Governor Brownback, you know, they, they cut taxes and and then they eventually had to raise taxes again because those were such, uh, the, 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 the tax cuts didn't work. They didn't bring about more economic growth and everything. What's, what's your retort to that? Well, that was what the Democrats were hoping to use as their argument. They always have to have an argument that explains tax cuts are no longer politically palatable. They'll never happen again. They announce this every five years. I keep a collection. Both my political demise is, is predicted and the tax issue is going to go away and it never works for them, but they keep <laughs> insisting on it. Uh, in Kansas, they had a, a tax cut, but they had several things. They had a very left-wing Supreme Court, which ruled that Kansas must spend a half a billion dollars, this is at state level, half a billion dollars more on education than the legislature had voted. And what Brownback should have done is said, thank you very much, Supreme Court, You're, that's nonsense. We reject that and we're gonna recall all of you. Instead, they accepted that and therefore the spending crushed the effort to be able to keep the, 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 spent the taxes to keep coming down. You also had a whole bunch of moderate Republicans there who wouldn't do any other spending restraint. And then you had some who wouldn't uh, allow liquor to be sold on Sundays, which would have allowed $60 million a year to be spent in Kansas instead of across the border in Missouri. There were quite a number of ways to have taken spending down and actually got a little more revenue without raising taxes, actually by cutting taxes by allowing people to buy on Sundays. But Kansas, I, I did a debate just today on CNBC with some lady who used to be a senator from North Dakota. How did those otherwise sensible people in North Dakota like this lady? But she, uh, <laughs> Kansas, Kansas, Kansas. And I looked at it, I thought, there are 24 red states cutting taxes now. None of them have the Kansas problem because the Kansas problem was an exogenous spending problem imposed by a Supreme Court outside of the Constitution and law. The Kansas is going to elect a Republican governor to go with their state legislature. They'll be back on track to phase down their income tax in the future. But you can point to North Carolina, which has been doing this for more than a decade. Every time they bring that marginal rate down, the top rate and now the single flat rate, more revenue comes in because people move into the state, they invest in the state. The same thing happens with each of the states as they phase down their income tax, they get more revenue, not less, which of course is a problem because then they spend it. Um, but you can spend it by cutting taxes, other taxes. And just to be clear, the way they're getting rid of the, say, the income tax is not right. to push it over to the sales tax, which okay. our friends over at the uh, tax foundation advise everybody when they first fail after and then finally give that up and, because the people who pay sales taxes really, really hate it. And it's the dumbest political idea ever invented by man. Do not take one tax and stick it on another and go, whoa, look at We just cut this one because you've accomplished nothing. But what they do is they say, we're going to have a spending limit. 
And when spending come, when revenue comes up above the spending limit, so you never get ahead of your ski tips, uh, you then permanently cut the income tax. And if there's okay. a recession, then you don't cut taxes that year. And if there's faster growth, then you cut more. That's how we're bringing it down state by state in Mississippi, in Georgia, and, in Iowa, in North Carolina. Hey, Grover, that's a, that's a great point because that was my next question. There's a lot of talk about revenue triggers. Are they using revenue triggers? Because then you hit certain goals within your revenue. Louisiana, for example, where I'm doing some work now with the Pelican Institute, they put in revenue triggers where their rainy day fund, a stabilization fund, and then their general fund all have to hit certain triggers before they can have any of their income or corporate income tax cuts. And do, do you, is that where, is that the direction most states are going or is it really the surplus, the spending limit, any surplus above that will then be used? Cause those, those are two different mechanisms. Well, you, you start with revenue coming in above a certain point, never allow that revenue to be stolen by the teachers union. It goes immediately to the people. Okay. If you allow that revenue to stick around, the cockroaches will come and eat your cake. Okay. So as soon as this you realize there's more money coming in than you plan to spend because you set a budget, then that money immediately goes to permit. Not not everybody gets a $300 check. That's spending, right. not a tax cut. That's spending. Uh, these rebates things are just criminally stupid. Um, and politicians, oh, I sent you $300. And next year, uh, next to nothing, sorry. Uh, yep. But a permanent so rate that, reduction. So that would be a surplus, right? You're using the surplus to cut the tax, not necessarily the revenue trigger or do you, do you couch them in different terms, or is that the same thing? I'm, I'm trying to... The revenue trigger, well, there are different triggers you can have. Right. The revenue trigger is when revenue comes up above a certain number, you set the number, this is what we're planning to spend, then you reduce uh, the taxes to get you back down to where the government's not bringing in more money than you intended to spend. Now, yeah. I always done a version of that where they say, we're going to go down, we're going to cut down, boom, 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 we're going to go down two tenths of a point, two tenths of a point, two tenths of a point. If we hit... Um, bumpy weather and, and uh, the, the economy slows. We have a budget over here, which is not the rainy day fund for disasters or droughts or something. It's the taxpayer fund, and it's only allowed to be used to lower taxes. So if you're starting to go down like this and there's a little bump, it's, and, and rather than, oh my goodness, we have to raise taxes for this week to do that, you, you take the money from the, from the taxpayer fund and you flatten out your curve and then you keep going that way. That money is only to be used to permanently redu to, to reduce taxes, um, and it's not simply going into um, the fund yeah. that Democrats will spend later. Yeah, spending, spending, spending. You know, I, I, we're working on a project right now, Grover. Um, you and I are on the sustainable state budgets all across the country to come up with spending limits um, based on a maximum of population growth plus inflation. And of course, that's a maximum. They should be l much lower than that, given the economic situation of each state, and also that they need to lower their state, lower their income taxes, lower their other taxes that they have to put in these triggers in place, so that if you do have a surplus, it should be returned to the taxpayer from from whence it came. And so I look forward to that sort of project as we move forward. A lot of other states have been doing this already. Texas passed a stronger spending limit in 2021. Um, they don't have quite the surplus yet um, trigger that will allow for tax cuts, but they're working on it there. But I think that's going to be something really important as we move forward. And so I, as we as we close, Grover, you know, I really just want to say I appreciate all the work that you've done over the years in tax reform um, and spending restraint and, and keeping both of these tied together. One of the things that I think sometimes we often from the right will will fall into a trap of just saying, well, just tax cuts will pay for themselves and we should be for tax cuts. But we've also got to put in there spending restraint. Yep. No wise words, Grover. I hope that we will see more of this going on across the country and each state, um, even local governments. Governments, of course, need to be restraining their spending and provide tax relief. And then hopefully at the federal level, we can get to a flat income tax and hopefully to a more of a consumption based tax. So that way that more people can prosper. And that's really the focus of this show. And I appreciate you being on the show, um, Grover. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Please give us a rating, hopefully a five star rating um, as we continue to, to work to find ways to tackle the biggest problems that we can to basically let people prosper. Thank you. Have a great day.